When she heard about the regicide, one Bermuda colonist said she thought that they that done it would never see the face of Christ. You're listening to Rejects and Revolutionaries with Sarah Tinsolvola, a podcast tracing the origins of America from the Tudor era to the 20th century. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. School begins next week and summer is over. And so I've decided that my goal going forward is going to be to do this as a bi-weekly show to see if that's a little more sustainable than releasing episodes every week. I'll do anything I can to avoid another nine-month delay, but do realize the episode release might be a little more erratic for a while. My hope, though, is that I can settle on this bi-weekly thing as a long-term strategy. But back to the story. To a degree, I think that, even today, we can comprehend, to some extent, the shock of regicide. It's not completely new at this point, it's happened a few times in history, and by and large we don't believe in the divine right of kings anymore, but we do notice when our public figures are murdered or assassinated. To this day, people remember exactly where they were when they first heard that JFK had been shot. And even 150 years after his death, we know the details of Lincoln's assassination. It doesn't take a belief in the divine right of kings to be particularly shocked when somebody in a position of authority is killed. And then you add to that the fact that this wasn't a simple assassination. Plenty of people expected King Charles I to be assassinated. In fact, he himself was prepared for the possibility. What happened, though, was done very deliberately, in an organized, planned way by a relatively large group of people who then went on to take control of the country. Think about that happening in the present day, and I would venture a guess that your feelings would be pretty similar to the feelings back then. The thing that we really can't fathom, though, is just how little colonists could have seen this coming. A one-way trip across the Atlantic took at least six weeks, and they were only common in certain months of the year. In contrast, the time period between Pride's Purge and the actual execution was only a month, and the time between the trial and execution was only ten days. In all likelihood, colonists got the news of regicide sometime between April and August, and they almost certainly got all of the news at once. They would certainly have heard that a second war had broken out, and they would have heard about the defeat of the Scots, which doomed the royalist side in that war, and they probably would have heard about things like the fall of Colchester. But that's all fairly standard. They might and I stress might, possibly, have heard about the idea of executing the king being raised at Putney, but officially, the leveler movement had never been anything more than a group of fringe radicals. So, colonists would have spent the winter and spring waiting for news of the treaty with the king and wondering things like, who would concede what? What would England look like going forward? What would the role of the king be in government? Would there be bishops? And if so, what would be their role? But instead, sometime between April and August, the news was that the king had been beheaded after an army coup and trial, and now England would be governed without one, and without even a full parliament. As we'll discuss soon, even Massachusetts Bay struggled with this, but in six colonies, the reaction was strong enough to turn into rebellion. These were Bermuda, Virginia, Maryland, Newfoundland, Antigua, and Barbados. These six colonies said that the king's death made the Prince of Wales the new rightful ruler and declared King Charles II to be the legitimate authority over their colonies. 
They didn't petition Parliament to reconsider. They didn't agitate for a change in policy. What they did was most akin to what Scotland had done, which was to say, we are our own entity and Charles II is our king. Scotland was an independent country, though. Virginia and Barbados were not. This is a really interesting dynamic, because in declaring their non-recognition of the new government, these colonies were de facto declaring independence from England. As we'll see, and as Virginia in particular will make very explicit, they were saying that they would take their colonial orders and pay their colonial dues to England's rightful king and not its usurping government. The details of how this happened differed from colony to colony, but there were also some interesting similarities, so today we'll go through all six colonies in order. Chronologically, the first was Bermuda, where there was an armed rebellion, exile, and a new governor. Colonists there were already willing to go to Bermuda rather than be governed by an independent and they had just received several ships worth of royalist prisoners, so as soon as they heard about the regicide, a large group of people rose up in arms and started marching on St. George's. Leading citizens and indentured servants alike were a part of this march, and even the island's militia joined them. Once they reached the capital, the mob ousted all remaining independents in the Bermudian government. Then, Unencumbered by independent resistance, Turner declared Prince Charles to be King Charles II, passed a law which required all Bermudians to take an oath of allegiance to him, and removed government protection from anyone who wouldn't. Effectively, this meant that independents had to leave Bermuda, and most of them made their way to the island of Eleuthera or back to England where they complained to Parliament about their treatment, saying that even Spanish sailors who had been shipwrecked were treated better than independents in Bermuda. Turner did end up being replaced as governor three or so months after the rebellion, and how exactly that happened isn't clear. Most recent scholars that I've read have just assumed that the rebellion ousted Turner when the primary source documentation doesn't actually back that up, and it doesn't really fit with the history that we've already discussed. Thinking of that history, my guess is that when news did reach England about what Turner was doing, the Bermuda Company sent orders that he stop being governor and possibly nominated a replacement. They certainly didn't want it to look like their colony was trying to subvert the new Commonwealth, and they'd also never quite been comfortable with Turner's leadership in Bermuda. Maybe then they nominated an independent to be the leader, and the colonists simply ignored the order and instead nominated rebellion leader John Trimmingham as Turner's replacement against the wishes of the company. So whatever the precise details, Bermudians had made their declaration and they had a governor willing to defend it. Trimmingham then sent an envoy to Barbados proposing an alliance and asking for a supply of arms and ammunition to uphold the royalist cause. In other words, they wanted arms and ammunition to defend their separation from the English state if England sent anyone to force them into submission. We've only seen this even briefly considered once before, but Bermuda was now preparing to fight England in order to defend its separation from the English government. Virginia took matters even further, and it was open enough about its plans that newspapers as far away as London were reporting the colony's willingness to declare independence if that was what it took to avoid affiliation with a regicidal government. Virginia had also had a second wave of royalists come to settle after Parliament had confiscated their estates after the Second War and the regicide. Berkeley actively encouraged these people to come, and this encouragement brought some relatively high-ranking royalists as well as a wave of Anglican ministers into Virginia, where they contributed to a cultural boom and in many ways laid the foundations of 
for the future of Virginian culture and religious life. There was no need for an armed rebellion in Virginia, but Upper Norfolk and Nansemon counties did expel their remaining Puritans, and those people also went to Maryland's town of Providence. Berkeley then called an assembly, and the colony drafted and passed a declaration of loyalty to the late, most excellent, and now undoubtedly sainted king, denouncing those unparalleled treasons perpetrated against him and allowing for the punishment of anyone who supported the regicide, mocked the king's memory, or refused to acknowledge Charles II as the legitimate ruler of Virginia. After this was done, Berkeley sent Colonel Richard Lee to formally invite Charles II to rule Virginia by returning his old commission and requesting a new one confirming him as governor. With the same envoy, he also sent requests and suggestions about how to best govern the colony. He recommended that Claiborne be removed from his position of treasurer, and he wanted support in helping to defend the colony against military attack from either England or New England. He had a plan of defense, just needed approval and a little support. And as part of this support, he also encouraged royalist military leaders to come to Virginia to help him organize any sort of necessary resistance. Berkeley also started building connections between the court in exile and Virginia. This was easy enough given the connections that he already had. His brothers and most of his closest friends were at that court, and now there were a handful of royalists in Virginia with similarly deep transatlantic connections who could help with this. Charles responded by agreeing to pretty much everything. He sent a new commission to Berkeley to run our plantations in Virginia who have carried themselves with so much loyalty and fidelity to the king, our father of blessed memory. And including in that commission directions to build castles and forts of lime and stone for the better suppressing of such of our subjects as shall at any time invade those territories. Virginia wasn't a strong colony by any stretch of the imagination, but more than any, it was serious about doing everything in its power to remain separate from the English government. Now, there's actually a funny thing that's worth noting here. The Virginia Company and fears of its reemergence were still helping to motivate the aversion to Commonwealth rule. They'd been a crown colony, and the idea of reconstituting the company had popped up from time to time, but the company had been dissolved a generation ago at this point. I mean, we know how bad the Virginia Company's leadership was, but it's amazing and hilarious to me that after three decades, two civil wars, and a revolution which was unprecedented in European history— that avoiding a renewed Virginia company was still a driving motivation and unifying force in Virginia politics. Next was Maryland, and if not as overtly determined as Virginia, Maryland risked more than any other colony for its loyalty. As we've seen time and time again, Maryland has always been under more scrutiny than any other colony. The most recent example of Marylanders being singled out was that Giles Brent had been forced to leave Maryland after his estates were sequestered by Parliament. That's not something I've heard of happening to any other colonist who spent the war in America. Meanwhile, Baltimore was still in England, desperately trying to protect the colony and his ownership of it, and a declaration for the king would effectively doom that. In addition, the colony had an ever-increasing population of Puritans, some recently from England, having been recruited by Baltimore himself, were happier to play by the rules. Given this fact, and the timing of their move, which was just after the irrecoverable collapse of the Presbyterian movement in England, it's a fair bet that these were mostly Presbyterians instead of Independents. The recent transplants from Virginia, on the other hand, immediately started challenging the colony's government once they arrived. 
after getting permission to settle, the exiled Virginians immediately refused to sign the Oath of Allegiance, claiming it was an oath to support a government which upheld Antichrist. And knowing that the colony was too weak to actually enforce the rules against 300 of them. After being kicked out of Virginia and welcomed in Maryland on the basis of religious liberty, these people protested, extending that same freedom to the Catholics and Anglicans who had founded the colony in the first place. They simply occupied the land, got no formal grants, paid no taxes, refused to participate in the colony's general assembly, and made themselves a lingering threat to Maryland's already tenuous stability. Because of all of that, the declaration for Charles II did happen in a fascinatingly different way in Maryland. So just to orient ourselves in time, news of the regicide reached the Chesapeake around August of 1649. In September, the new governor, William Stone, went to Virginia for three months, leaving his deputy governor, the devoted Catholic royalist Thomas Green, in charge. The November meeting of the General Assembly quickly and easily declared the colony's allegiance to Charles II as their rightful leader, and to further the common rejoicing of the inhabitants on that occasion, declared a general pardon to all citizens for all offenses. This, I'm sure, was specifically meant to appeal to Puritans who hadn't been following the colony's rules. Stone returned in time for the next assembly, but he didn't address the issue and simply went about managing the day-to-day affairs of the colony, refining assembly procedures, and so forth. These things actually weren't quite as trivial as I just made them seem, but the point is that Stone allowed the declaration of submission to Charles II, instead of the English government, to stand. It was, I think, a very clever evasion, and though I am always working with limited documentation doing this podcast, and therefore can in no way prove this, there's not a doubt in my mind that it was intentional. The Virginia exiles, though, were extremely displeased by the Declaration of Loyalty, and they weren't persuaded to accept it by the removal of punishments that they already had no intention of accepting. While everybody else seems to have supported or at least accepted the declaration, Providence residents reported all the actions of Maryland's government to England and then started spreading rumors in Maryland that the rump parliament was about to overthrow their local government. Next was Newfoundland. Here the declaration was very much a top-down thing. The colony's leadership had always been almost exclusively royalist, and its population was from a royalist-leaning part of England, Devon, but its minuscule population was mostly comprised of seasonal fishermen, a handful of people who catered to them, and a handful of ships' crews who stayed over winter. Most of the population was too preoccupied with the hardships of everyday life to make a stand, and as English ships were now almost exclusively parliamentarian, opposing the new English government would be inviting trouble. Proprietor David Kirk, though, did declare Newfoundland for Charles II, and even sent some ships to deal with any conflict resulting from the action. Prince Rupert was already in the area attacking parliamentarian shipping, so Kirk's idea was that these ships would join forces with Rupert's fleet. Kirk may have been dedicated to the king's cause, but thanks to Newfoundland's size, proximity to New England, and its non-permanent nature, this was the most minor of the rebellions that we'll discuss today, and it made virtually no impact on either Newfoundland or England. That, however, brings us to Barbados, and news of the regicide there tore the colony apart in a much more extreme way than it did anywhere else, and it was only after a year of strife that the colony finally made its declaration, 
The strife, though, wasn't really royalist versus independent. It was the result of a small group of people manipulating already heightened emotions in a bid for power, and very nearly getting it. The story of Barbados's declaration starts with one of the many distressed cavaliers who had made their way to the colony after the First Civil War, a man named Guy Molesworth. Molesworth was a perfect example of the embittered royalists who fled to the island. He was in his 30s, the oldest son of a wealthy Northamptonshire family, had served as an officer under Prince Rupert's brother Maurice, and he had lost everything to the war and sequestration. And it's worth noting that by everything, I mean everything his family had built over the course of generations, which had been passed down to him. It was a big, deeply personal loss. He then moved his wife and daughters to Barbados and spent the next couple years building up a new source of wealth, and he was even selected to be the colony's treasurer. There was nothing particularly wrong with Molesworth's character, but he was bitter, angry, and indignant, and he was by nature an abrasive type of a person. Making friends with the island's parliamentarians wasn't exactly on his to-do list, and if you were to try to identify the person who was most likely to incite a rebellion and kick out Barbadian parliamentarians, thanks to his unpleasantness alone, you might assume it would be him. And that is exactly what a man named Humphrey Walrond accused him of doing after the regicide. Walrond was a new arrival, arriving in Barbados at almost exactly the same time as news of the execution did, and he was nowhere near as distinguished a cavalier or person as Molesworth. A new world meant a new start, though, and he and his brother Edward labeled themselves moderates and set about making friends with the colony's elite, parliamentarian and royalist alike, paying particular attention to Governor Bell and James Drax. While royalists reeled and fumed over the regicide, the Walrens told Drax that Molesworth was trying to stage a servant rebellion, and that he had declared that it would never be well in this island until the Roundhead's estates were given to the poor cavaliers. To understand how feasible this was, we need to remember that a huge number of servants at this point were royalist victims of transportation. People who had, for their loyalty to the king or some minor offense, been condemned to indentured servitude in a colony where manual labor was particularly grueling. They could easily be incited to rebellion, and there had in fact been an attempted rebellion a couple years before. In the face of such threats, the Walren said Drax and the Parliamentarians should ally with them and defend Barbados. Bell wasn't convinced, but Drax was, and he rallied Barbados's Parliamentarians to circumvent Bell's authority and go after Molesworth. They constituted themselves a court-martial and imprisoned Molesworth for three months while the Walrens interrogated and intimidated people into backing their accusations. Even with the intimidation, there weren't enough people who would agree to the Walrens' story, so instead of being executed, Molesworth was simply banished. As the ship carrying him away left, it was attacked by a pirate who took what little he had managed to rebuild, and he never recovered financially. He moved to Virginia, where he was happily embraced, and he lived there until the Restoration. Then he moved back to England, and, long story short, his caustic bitterness pushed him to say things that caused him to be court-martialed yet again and sentenced to death. Because that sentence was also a bit of a stretch, it was commuted, and he returned home, only to be sent to debtor's prison. When finally released from there, he got a job as a dock worker in London, where he worked until his death. Awful, awful story, 
And all of that was fundamentally caused by the Walrens' accusations, and those accusations were false. But their saving the island from Molesworth had sufficiently ingratiated the Walverins to Barbadian parliamentarians that they were put in charge of a committee of public safety. They also got their ally, William Byam, put in Molesworth's old position of secretary. With that foundation of power, they immediately flipped their accusations and announced that they had now discovered a roundhead plot to drive all royalists from Barbados and finally declare the island's allegiance to Parliament. And now, the Walrens actually did what they had accused Molesworth of planning, leading a push for parliamentarians to be banished and their estates confiscated. They took the issue to the General Assembly, which was now filled with royalists. The thing you need to remember going forward is that the royalists of Barbados did, in fact, have very strong desires for the colony, as they did everywhere, and independent of anything the Walrens said. They were horrified by the regicide, they didn't like the independence, and the evidence would suggest that Barbadian independents were particularly odd in their outlook, associating with the Familists and later Quakers. If they had to choose between being governed by the king and the English government, they very much wanted the former. This was partially for ideological reasons, but it was partially for reasons that people who might be more ideologically aligned to the parliamentarians would also agree with. They feared the ever-present and now growing threat that the Commonwealth might restrict Barbadian trade, which was the source of their wealth. The Walrens had easily pushed the parliamentarians to join them by playing into existing fears, and now they were doing the exact same thing with the Royalists. The Walrens' push wasn't like the Royalist rebellions that we've seen in any other colony. It achieved some Royalist aims, but it was fundamentally a power play on the part of a very small group of people. The Walrens manipulated people by playing up very real fears and promising the fulfillment of very strong hopes. So, when they went to the assembly, most royalists didn't agree with the Walrens banishing their opponents, but after a few days of persuasion, they had convinced just enough people to gain a majority. The strongest opponent of their push was another royalist exile named Thomas Modiford. Urging refusal of the plan, Modiford gave a speech asking colonists to seek peace and compromise, which would also lead to plenty in the true Barbadian way. Then he submitted a bill advocating that the Barbadian government simply leave people alone as long as they would submit to its authority. This act actually gained traction but then the Walrens modified it until it did exactly the opposite of what Modiford had intended, and declared that the independents must leave Barbados. Legislatively beaten, Drax led a petitioning effort to demonstrate the general opposition to the law, including among royalists, and to ask Bell to order an immediate election. This election would still be won by royalists, but not those who agreed with the Walrens. Bell accepted the petition, and in response, the Walrens set their sights on him. They declared him a roundhead and started publishing pamphlets criticizing him and accusing Drax of leading a roundhead plot. Like their accusations against Molesworth, their accusations against Drax were convincing enough that even moderate royalists were pretty sure it was true. The only way to stay safe, the Walrens now insisted, was to rise up in arms and destroy Barbados's government, where the pretense of liberty meant slavery and tyranny. Then they could replace it with better leadership and declare their allegiance to Charles II, 
Most places didn't actually do anything, but near the Walrens' home, they did prepare to riot. They swear they will sheath their swords in the hearts of all those who do not drink a health to the figure second, and another to the confusion of the independent dogs. After being the governor who had first made Barbados a successful colony, and who had kept it together during all the years of war, Bell had now lost control, and he would never regain it. He issued a proclamation condemning the pamphlet war, which he said was raised on purpose to beget intestine and civil broils, and ordering the punishment of anyone who continued the chaos, including the death penalty for anyone who rose in arms. He authorized Drax to form a militia, and Drax immediately arrested Edward Walrand and William Byam. In response, a group of royalists started advancing on Bridgetown, and in response to that, Bell commissioned both Drax and Modiford to raise troops to oppose them. There was a showdown, but it was Bell who ordered his forces to back down, and it was Bell who accepted the Walrens' terms of peace. Independence would be disarmed, the use of the prayer book would be mandated, and the magazine at Bridgetown run by not just royalists, but Walrens allies. Twenty Barbadian parliamentarians would also stand trial for conspiring against the island's royalists, and finally, it was time that Barbados declare for Charles II as the rightful monarch. When Bell capitulated, everyone except the Walrens party abandoned the aging governor, and the Walrens started preparing to take complete control of the island. Watching the events unfold, though, was Francis Lord Willoughby of Parham. He was anchored in Carlisle Bay, waiting for the most strategic time to introduce himself and the twin commissions he bore, one from Carlisle and the other from Charles II, declaring him the new proprietor and governor of Barbados, respectively. Now, he decided, was that time. He landed and announced that by order of the king and lord proprietor, he was now the leader of Barbados. At the moment that the Walrens were emerging victorious, a new leader had arrived who was everything the royalists wanted in a leader, and perhaps more. Willoughby wasn't against the king. In fact, he had specifically gone out and gotten his commission from the king instead of parliament. He had fought for the king, and this had also led to his property being sequestered and his family living in poverty. So he had sacrificed for the king in the way that the other royalists of the island had. He supported the declaration for Charles II, and he was willing to defend it. The Walrens had been close to seizing power for themselves, but now the man standing in their way wasn't an independent or the aging governor. It was an esteemed and accomplished leader from England. The Walrens used their remaining momentum to push the assembly to put a three-month stay on Willoughby as governor, saying he was once a roundhead and might be again, and that they just needed to have some time to evaluate him before accepting him as the leader of the colony. The Walrens would use this time to try to salvage their victory, but Willoughby also had other islands to visit and his own strategies to consider, so he didn't fight this day, but agreed to return in three months. When Willoughby left, the Walrens brought the 20 named parliamentarians to trial, and most of them simply left Barbados rather than go through the inevitable. Those that remained were fined exorbitant amounts, from five to 80,000 pounds of sugar, followed by the sequestration of their estates and the passing of legislation hostile to Puritans. Then they tried to establish a strong political base who would reject Willoughby and support their leadership. They promised poor, 
royalists' shares of the confiscated wealth. Then, bizarrely, they told the island's remaining parliamentarians that if they were put in charge, they would work to set up a popular government, saying that this had been their goal all along. As they were doing all of this, Willoughby was touring the other islands that he now controlled. He pushed each one to hold its own legislative assemblies rather than leaving governance to the governor's council alone. But his commissions were rejected in every colony that leaned parliamentarian. Since Carlyle's ownership was only nominal at this point, thanks to the 1647 court case, Willoughby's lease didn't entitle him to control anything. And the King's commission was even less persuasive. Interestingly, even St. Kitts refused to recognize Willoughby because their royalist diehard governor, Thomas Warner, had died a few months earlier and been replaced by somebody whose main goal was to avoid conflict, which meant accepting the new commonwealth. Only Antigua accepted Willoughby as the legitimate proprietor. Their governor, Henry Ashton, had been appointed by Charles I to help end the devastating conflict of Barbados's earliest years, and he was consistently loyal to the royalist cause. He had led the colony in proclaiming Charles II and expelling the colony's independence with very little opposition, and now he accepted Willoughby with similar ease. When Willoughby returned to Barbados, he forged an alliance with Modiford, and together they upheld the declaration for the king while depriving the Walrens of their government offices and returning property to both remaining and returning parliamentarians. So by 1650, there were six colonies who had effectively declared themselves independent from the English Commonwealth, and instead declared that their true legitimate authority was the uncrowned king living in the Netherlands. In response, the Rump passed an Act for Restricting Trade, which forbade all ships from all nations from trading with Virginia, Bermuda, Barbados, and Antigua, and allowing privateers to prey on any ships which actually did trade with them a particularly enticing prospect in the sugar-producing Caribbean islands. Newfoundland wasn't targeted because Parliament simply punished Kirk, and Maryland would be addressed separately, too. It'll take several episodes for this story to fully play out, but for now, what we have is six colonies toying with the idea of being ruled by a government other than the one ruling England. And in the Act for Restricting Trade, as we'll soon see, a step toward the Navigation Act. And next episode, we're going to start looking at the beginnings of what we think of when we think of the British Empire. 